Good evening, dear friends and brethren. It's our privilege and joy to be here this evening to attend the Saturday night meeting of the Lewis Christian Conference. And it's our even greater joy to join together in worshiping the one and only living God yes. in the name of Jesus Christ. Yes. And that is our privilege and that is our, our um, love to do so. Uh, just a few intimations before we begin. After the service, uh, we'll be meeting in the church hall uh, next door where there'll be stalls from the Christian Institute, um, TBS, Sasra, and uh, the Stornoway Christian Bookshop. So we hope to see you there, and uh, Dr. Smith and his wife will be there so you can get a chance to meet um, Dr. Smith and his wife and, and speak to them and ask them any questions that you have. So we're going to begin our worship by singing from Psalm 116. Psalm 116. You'll see the words on the screen there and on your flyer. I love the Lord because my voice and prayers he did hear. A while I live will call on him who bowed to me his ear. Of death the cords and sorrows did about me compass round. The pains of hell took hold on me. I grief and trouble found. Upon the name of God the Lord, then did I call and say, Deliver thou my soul, O Lord, I do thee humbly pray. Down to verse 11 and 12. I said when I was in my haste that all men liars be, what shall I render to the Lord for all his gifts to me?
that was wonderful. And the tune Ken was singing there was St. Columba, so it was very, very appropriate. Um, I love the Lord because my voice and prayers heed it here. So we'll join together in a word of prayer, knowing that in Jesus Christ, God hears our prayers. Gracious and glorious God, you created all things by the power of your word in the space of six days and rested on the seventh. We praise you and thank you that you are merciful, that you are holy, that you are just and righteous, and that you have reached down and set your love upon us. You have brought us to salvation in Jesus Christ, and we are here to worship in the name of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. And Lord, we praise you and thank you for every single person gathered here, Lord. And we pray that you'll bless each person according to the needs of their soul, whether that is strengthening, whether it's encouragement, whether it's comforting, or whether it's rebuke, Lord, or whether it's salvation. We pray, Lord, that this, this would be the day, the, the moment where there is joy before the angels over a sinner that is saved. And we pray for our dear brother Robert here, that you, Lord, would bless him and fill him with the power of the Holy Spirit, that every word that he preaches would hit, hit the target, that it would pierce the heart of those who are listening. And uh, we pray, Lord, he would be the first to admit that he cannot do it on his own. So we ask for your blessing and your strengthening, your anointing from on high. And we pray, Lord, that uh, you will be with us, as you have promised, where two or three are gathered, you are there in the midst. And that is the, the, the promise that we have, and we plead it to you, Lord. We also ask, uh, we plead the promise. You said, ask and you shall receive. Yes. Seek and you shall find. Knock and the door shall be opened unto you. And that is the wonderful promise that we plead to you again. And we know you are God who keeps his promises. So we trust in you, Lord. We trust that you want to bless us as a father blesses his children. So come amongst us this night. Open our eyes to see wonderful things in your law and show us Christ in all his beauty and all his glory by the power of the Holy Spirit. Be with us now, we pray, for the forgiveness of our sins. Amen. So, uh, Dr. Robert Smith is from Cincinnati, Ohio, and we're very pleased to have him here speaking this evening. Um, he's in the Peace and Divinity School in Alabama, professor there. So, uh, I've only met Dr. Robert Smith uh, briefly last night, but within moments uh, you feel like you've known him for years. And that is a wonderful, a wonderful uh, ex expression of the, the connection we have in Jesus Christ and the love that we share with one another. So, without any further ado, I'll pass it over to Robert. God bless you. Even now, Lord Jesus, even now, even now, for I asked this in your name, amen. God be praised. I call your attention to the second chapter of the book of Joshua, verses 1 through 15. Joshua chapter 2, verses 1 through 15. Joshua chapter 2, since I'm Trinitarian, verses 1 through 15, three times. I want to talk about rated aura for redemption. Joshua 2, 1 through 15, hear these words from the word. Then Joshua, son of Nun, secretly sent two spies from Shittim. Go, look over the land, he said, especially Jericho. So they went and entered the house of a prostitute named Rahab and stayed there. The king of Jericho was told, look, some of the Israelites have come here tonight to spy out the land. So the king of Jericho sent this message to Rahab. Bring out the men who came to you and entered your house because they have come to spy out the whole land. But the woman had taken the two men and hidden them. She said, yes, the men came to me, but I did not know where they had come from. At dusk, when it was time to close the city gate, the men left. I don't know which way they went. Go after them quickly. You can catch up with them. 
But she had taken them up to the roof and hidden them under the stalks of flax where she had laid out on the roof. So the men set out in pursuit of the spies on the road that leads to the fords of the Jordan. And as soon as the pursuers had gone out, the gate was shut. Before the spies lay down for the night, she went up on the roof and said to them, I know that the Lord has given this land to you and that a great fear of you has fallen on us so that all who live in this country are melting in fear because of you. We have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea for you when you came out of Egypt. And what you did to Sihon and Og, the two kings of the Amorites east of the Jordan, whom you completely destroyed. When we heard of it, our hearts melted and everyone's courage failed because of you. For the Lord your God is God in heaven above and on the earth below. Now then, Please swear to me by the Lord that you will show kindness to my family because I have shown kindness to you. Give me a sure sign that you will spare the lives of my father and mother, my brothers and sisters, and all who belong to them, and that you will save us from death. Our lives for your lives, the men assured her. If you don't tell what we are doing, we will treat you kindly and faithfully when the Lord gives us the land. So she let them down by a rope through the window. For the house she lived in was part of the city wall. I'm convinced that the greatest obstacle to the knowledge of the Bible is the knowledge of the Bible. What keeps us from knowing more about the Bible is what we think we already know about the Bible. And therefore, the diamond of Scripture has been revealed to us in all facets. And there's nothing new to learn, particularly from a passage like this. Joshua chapter 2, verses 1 to 15. You hear it, and if you're not careful, you will say, I've already surveyed that teaching passage. I have already canvassed that teaching passage. In fact, I've already bought the territory of that teaching passage. I've taught it, I've heard it taught, I've preached it, I've heard it preached. There is nothing new that can be gained from it at all. This passage has become for some of us all too common, all too familiar, all too mundane, all too simple. So much so that God has nothing new to say to us. But I hope that you and I will take this passage and climb up into the cranium of Yahweh with it and stay there long enough so that the common becomes uncommon and the familiar becomes unfamiliar. The mundane becomes magnificent, and the simple becomes stupendous. And we say to God, sing it over again to me. Wonderful words of life. Let me more of their beauty see. Wonderful words of life. Words of life and beauty. Teach me faith and duty. Beautiful words, wonderful words. Wonderful words of life. And this text opens with two spies on an espionage mission who cross the fords of the Jordan River and proceed to enter into the city of Jericho. And they go to the oldest profession in human history, prostitution brothel housing. Rahab is the madame of this establishment. Rahab, the prostitute. For every New Testament doctrine, there is an Old Testament picture. The New Testament doctrine that claims our attention tonight is redemption. The Old Testament picture is Rahab, the prostitute. It's a dubious designation. 
It's one that she can't relinquish and even shake. In fact, even scripture seems to bind her to this dubious designation. Rahab, the prostitute. There it is in chapter 2, verse 1. And these spies entered into the house of Rahab, the prostitute. Chapter 6 of Joshua, verse number 17. Joshua says to these two spies, when the walls fall, make sure that you go to the house of Rahab, the prostitute, to rescue her and all of those in the house. Chapter 6 of Joshua, verse 22. These two spies do exactly that, and they rescue Rahab, the prostitute, and those who are dwelling inside of the house. And chapter 6, verse 25 of the book of Joshua, the Bible says, Rahab, the prostitute, and all that were in her house are spared. The Old Testament won't release her from this dubious designation. Certainly there'd be some liberation and some freedom in the New Testament when this dubious designation will be released and relinquished and will fall away from her. And when we enter the book of James, the letter of James, chapter 2, verse 25, James says, Rahab, the prostitute, was considered justified, considered righteous because of what she did. For she gave lodging to the spies and sent them in a different direction. Well, maybe we can get some help from Hebrews chapter 11. The hall of faith, the heroes and the heroines of faith. Chapter 11 of Hebrews, verse number 31. By faith, Rahab, the prostitute, did not perish with the disobedience, for she welcomed the spies. Every time she's mentioned, it's Rahab, the prostitute. I find it interesting that as we read scripture, we tend to associate people with their past. And we never allow them, even as we read it, we we'll never allow them to be forgotten in terms of their past. And oftentimes forget what God has done for them in their present and will do in their future. It's Jacob, whose name means trickster, supplanter, wrestler. And he wrestles with a divine presence. It could be a theophany or Christophany, presence of God in the Old Testament in human form, presence of Christ in the Old Testament before Bethlehem in human form. And he's changed. Chapter 32, verse number 28. He's changed. His name is no longer Jacob. It is Israel. And Israel means God fights. But we still think about him in terms of Jacob. We call him that. And in 2 uh, Kings chapter 5, verse 17, Naaman the leper mm, says, I will no longer offer up burnt sacrifices and offerings to any other God except the Lord. But when we refer to him, though he is now cleansed, we call him Naaman the leper. Or Mary Magdalene in Mark chapter 16, verse number 9, she has had seven demons cast out of her, and Jesus has appointed her as the missionary who will deliver the message to the disciples. Tell my disciples and Peter that I go before them to meet them in Galilee. But when we refer to Mary, we call her Mary Magdalene, the one of whom Jesus cast out seven devils. Or Zacchaeus in Luke chapter 19, verse 9. Yes, he was a swindler. Yes, he betrayed his Jewish brothers. Yes. But in verse number 9, Jesus says, you are now a son of Abraham. Oh, we call Thomas doubting Thomas. But we hear him say to Jesus in John chapter 11, verse 16, let us go and die with you. It doesn't sound like fear, doesn't sound like cowardice. He's willing to die with Jesus if necessary. And there of all of, there are in all of us here a past 
some things that we are ashamed of and regret. And I want you to know, the blood does not cleanse most of our sins. The blood cleanses all of our sins. My sin, oh, the bliss of that glorious thought. My sins, not in part, but the whole nailed to the cross. And I bear it no more. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, oh, my soul. They're gone. We are redeemed. We've been washed in the blood of the Lamb, and we don't have to worry about dubious designations. They are gone. Rahab, the prostitutes. Corey Ten Boom, a survivor of the Holocaust, uh, she saw embarrassment. She saw um, siblings die, a father, mother, etc., in hiding place. Uh, she survives the uh, concentration camps of Adolf Hitler. And once the war is over, she is presenting a message in one of the German churches and looks over after the message is over. She looks and sees one of the German officers who had made fun of her and her sister and other, other women as they would um, take off their clothes and take showers. <laughs> she remembered that. She remembered the sting, the pain of a man laughing at their naked bodies. And when she got finished preaching, the man, the German officer came up to her and said, isn't it wonderful to be redeemed? And he reached out his hand to shake her hand and her arm would not move. These are her words. It was like after a while as if God was asking her, hmm, you talk about reconciliation and forgiveness, then you need to reach out and shake the hand of this man who is now a Christian. She said she felt release coming, and she was able to shake his hand and show a sign of rec racial re of reconciliation. Uh, she paraphrased Psalm 103, verses 10 to 12, that when God forgives us, he casts our sins as far as the east from the west. They never meet again. And her paraphrase is this. When God forgives us, he takes and puts a no fishing allowed sign on the seashore so that no one can purchase a license to fish up our sins. In fact, you can't fish up your own sins. They are gone. Thanks be to God for redemption that he has purchased at the cost of the blood of his own son who was raised from the dead by the Holy Spirit in the writings of Paul in Romans chapter 8, verse number 11. You may not know this name, African-American former baseball player, Daryl Strawberry, who was a great hitter, number 18, played for the New York Mets, played for the New York Yankees, played for the Los Angeles Dodgers, but he aborted his career. He shortened his career. He truncated his career. He abbreviated his career by an addiction to alcohol and drugs. Could have played longer and achieved greater things. But drugs pronounced, if you will, an ending on his career. I have been in ministry with Daryl Strawberry. He's a Christian. And the motto of his ministry is this. Make your mess your ministry. Make your mess your ministry. That God can take our messes and turn them into ministries so that we can let people know that God saves not only from the uttermost, but from the guttermost. The blood of Jesus reaches to the highest mountain that flows to the lowest valley. The blood that gives me strength from day to day will never ever lose its power. No one is unredeemable and we must not give up on anyone no matter how deep in sin they are. Jesus is able to save from sin. These two spies appointed by Joshua are sent to explore the land. Joshua points two, just two. And they had to go into Jericho and find out the state of the people's emotional and psychological state and to find out the fortifications, et cetera, so that they will be prepared uh, in their warfare against them. Joshua chooses two. Uh, Moses chose 12. And 10 of them came back with a um, majority report. We can't do it, they said some 40 years ago. We can't do it. 
There are giants in the land. Two came back with a minority report. They didn't want to give a giant report. They wanted to give a grape report, G-R-A-P-E. We don't want to talk about giants. God take care of giants. We don't want to talk about the grapes. The grapes were so large that on one stalk, it took two of us to bear. How to take care of the giants. We will enjoy the grapes. And now Joshua has learned not to send 12, but to send two. As we must learn that if you want to assure yourself that very little will happen in church, appoint too many people on the committee. You don't need 12. Take people who have faith, who have a vision, who have courage, and who have heard what God has said. And so Joshua sends two to represent Caleb and Joshua, who were faithful spies. They go to this brothel. That's where the news, it's the welcome center. Okay? It's the, how do you say it? Houcha? For welcome, how do you say that word? For welcome? All right, y'all know what I'm talking about. That's what it was. All the news took place there. People were informed of the latest events there, and they listened. They wanted to be incognito. They, uh, they wanted to be um, uh, unknown. Uh, they didn't want to uh, be individuals who were known but anonymous, but they are detected. And the king gets word of it, the king of Jericho, and sends members of the JPD, the Jericho Police Department, if you will, there to talk to the Madame Rahab. Who is the Madame of the brothel in Jericho? Uh, they said, look, the king has sent a message to you. The king has said, we know that there were some spies who were sent over here to check out our city. They're getting ready to participate in combat against us. Surrender them. She has, before they get there, she has taken these two spies on top of the roof and covered them up with flax. That's important, flax, flax, flax and come back down. Now she's able to respond to the members of the G Jericho Police Department and to say to them, yes, they were there, but they're gone now. I don't know where they went, but if you pursue them immediately, you'll be able to overtake them. Now, that's a bald-faced lie. They are still there. It's, 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 it's a lie. And God doesn't bless lies, but she is blessed, not because of her lie, to save these spies. She's blessed because of her faith, as we will see in verse number 10 and 11. She had faith, but it's a flawed faith. And don't be so quick to judge her with her flawed faith. Here is Abraham, who is the father of the Jewish nation, and he's down in Egypt. And when the Pharaoh looks at his wife, the Bible says that Sarah was beautiful, even in that advanced age. Abraham is concerned that the Pharaoh will take his wife, put her in a harem, and then will kill him to silence his voice. And Abraham says, that's not my wife. That's my sister. That's a lie. But God takes this man with flawed faith Faith enough to leave Ear of the Chaldees at 75, but not faith enough to trust God to keep him in Egypt, even at an older age. And God, out of Abraham, produces a nation that is more multitudinous as the stars in the sky and as the sun on the seashore. I think we need to be patient with each other. We want people to be advanced uh, beyond justification to the point that they are ready to be glorified. Many of our young people, we want, when they become Christians, we want to, if you will, clean the fish before we catch the fish. Don't give them time to go through spiritual metamorphosis. Don't give them time to develop. All you need to do is just look back at your life and you will see that you needed time to shake off some things and to grow into the image of Jesus Christ himself as we are experiencing sanctification. No, God did not bless a lie. God blessed her faith, even though it was flawed. So please be patient with me. God is not through with me yet. 
when God gets through with me, as Job says in Job 23 and 10, I shall come forth as pure gold. Well, after these members of the JPD, Jericho Police Department, left, she goes back on top of the roof. She uncovers the men, and she begins to talk to them. She says to them these words. Our hearts are melting, like snow melting from the top of Mount Hermon. Our hearts are melting with fear because we know that you're going to take our city. Uh, we have heard what your God did over 40 years ago at the Red Sea, how he opened up the Red Sea and made a super highway through it so that your people walked through it without even getting their feet wet. We heard about that. For faith does come by hearing, as Paul says in Romans 10, 17, and hearing by the word of God. We didn't see it, but we heard it. And then more recently, we heard how your God fought for you in defeating Sihon and Og of Heshbon and Bashan. And so therefore our hearts are fearful. Plus, verses 10 and 11, I know that your God is sovereign. He is the God who is in heaven ruling and on earth ruling. He rules heaven and earth. We cannot defeat you. We know that. And therefore, she says to them in terms of bargaining, remember her faith is flawed. I have saved your life. I have not let the members of the JPD know where you were. They are out looking for you, and you're here. Now, since I've spared you, what will you do to spare me and my family? What will you do to protect us when you come to our city and uh, the walls come tumbling down, so to speak? And they say to her, here is a sign. If you gather people of your family, since you have a mother, father, sisters, and brothers, and they have others, all of those folk who will be in your house under your roof, Whenever the walls come down, and no one knows that, then they will be safe. Take this scarlet rope and hang it out your window so that it will, it will be under, the house will be under divine protective custody when we make our way to demolish and destroy your house. But if you or any of the members of your family take and divulge this information, then the blood will be on your own heads. But otherwise, you are protected from that. Well, they took and they left and uh, went back to tell Joshua this great report of how the people understood that they could not win because God is sovereign and God is already victorious. <laughs> the scarlet rope is figurative, respectively, of the Passover. Because in the Passover, uh, those individuals who were in a house where there was the blood of the Passover lamb smeared on the doorposts and lintels of the houses, the death angel passed by. Mm. So it, it, it's reflective of uh, the Passover in the past. The, per, the perspective look is a reflection of the anticipation of the Passover in Jesus' day. The communion service, the Lord's Supper, the Eucharist, where Jesus will take and drink and will eat bread uh, and say to the disciples, do this in remembrance of me. Mm. But it is also anticipatory of the marriage supper of the Lamb. In Revelation 19, verses 7 through 9, Jesus has already said in Matthew 26, verse 29, I will not drink of this cup with you any longer until that's future, until I do it in my father's kingdom and at the marriage supper of the lamb in Revelation 19, 7 through 9, there we will gather, the church triumphant and the church militant, will gather to commune with our Lord and to give him praise for redemption and for victory. This woman is one of the great heroines of Scripture. She's an unlikely hero. Who would think that God would take a prostitute and use her as an instrument 
for the deliverance of his people, we would have written her off. Number one, she's a prostitute. Number two, she's a woman. I want you to know God doesn't write you off. God takes you where you are and moves you to where he wants to take you. Our hope is only built on Jesus. Our hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. We dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. When Christ the solid rock we stand, all other ground is sinking sand. She's one of the great heroes or heroines of Scripture. Some may ask, well, you know, she took quite a chance by, if you will, cooperating with these two spies in the espionage mission. She could have lost her life and lost her family. I think it's the wrong question to ask. Which could she have lost? The right question is, what did she have to gain? She's already admitted. We're going to lose. God has put us on his docket for destruction. It's not what she will lose. It's what she will gain. Paul, in reminiscing about his life, he said, those things that were gained to me, mm, I counted loss. I know that I was a Pharisee of Pharisees. Mm. I, I know that I'm, I come from Benjamin, the tribe from which the first king came from. Uh, I know I had um, renown. And I had notoriety and all that. But the things that were gained to me, I kind of lost that I might win Christ. So Jim Elliott is right as he reminds us. He meets his end in South America among Indians that he and others were witnessing to. He is no fool who gives what he cannot keep in order to gain what he cannot lose who gives what he cannot keep, can't keep his life, to gain what he cannot lose, eternal life, can't lose that. And here, this prostitute that will be transformed takes the risk, not about what she will lose, but about what she will gain. I thank God for long suffering and for divine patience. This is an, ev an evangelistic text. Look how long Rahab has to witness. She sends these two spies out. She says, now you take and leave and they go out. Mm. And how do they go out? Because chapter 2 verse Five says that thus the gates are closed. Chapter 2 verse 7 says the gates were closed when the pursuers of these two spies left. Chapter 6 verse 1 says because of the encroachment and the approaching of the army of Jericho, the gates were shut. So Jericho is on lockdown. How do you get out of Jericho, that is these two spies, if the gates are shut? I've come to tell you tonight that when the gates and the doors are shut in your life, God opens windows. And that's the way they get out. In Joshua 2.15, these two men were let out of a window. We only talk about the windows of God generally when we talk about tithing. Galatia, Malachi 3 and 10. Bring all the tithes and offerings to the storehouse that I might have meat in my house and prove me that we're... If I would not open up the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing that there would not be room enough to receive, I want you to know that whenever you as a child of God faces a locked door and you can't get through, God will open windows. Have you any rivers that you think are uncrossable? Do you have any mountains that you can't tunnel through? God specializes in things that seem to be impossible, and he will do what no other doctor can do. Have you ever been on your bed of afflictions, and the, the doctor has done all that he can do? I listened to that brother last night. Share how the doctors did not expect him to live. Is that what you said? And God brought him out, and look at him today, because God specializes 
in healing all manner of diseases, and he will do what another power can do. I find it amazing, people who don't believe in miracles, they say, no, that's, that's, that, that happened in the past, and uh, the, the miraculous works are over. They don't believe in a miracle until they need one. And when they need one, then all of a sudden, they seek a God who can open windows, heal diseases, put marriages back together, bring wandering children back home. He's able to do that. These men, once they are let out of the window, they go to the mountains and stay three days according to the instructions of Rahab the prostitute. So she has three days to evangelize her relatives. Then after three days, they find a narrow place uh, in the Jordan River, and there are places like that. They go across the fords of the Jordan and then down into the camp of Jericho to re rejoin Joshua and the congregation and tell Joshua the state of the mind of people and that they know that God is fighting for Israel. Well, we're told that in uh, the, the chapter 3, 4, and 5, we're told that they are given hmm, three days. They're going to move from where they are to Shittim and will be in Shittim for three days. That's three more days to witness. Three days to stay in the mountain, one day to get back to Jericho, three days to be in Shittim. And then they're told that they're going to cross the Jordan River. A million and a half people, the oldest one being 58 since they wandered in the wilderness for 38 years and those who are older than 20 years of age perish, it's 58. But you had older people who were infirm and women who were pregnant and babies and children who were nursing as infants. It takes a long time for a million and a half people to cross a river. That's a day. That's eight days. Then chapter 5 of the book of Joshua, verse number 1. They're ready now to take and fight Jericho, right? They're in Gilgal. They've been there. No, God says, take and circumcise all the men who were not circumcised uh, uh, before, uh, they were not circumcised. Why? Because in the wilderness, one, no one got circumcised, and they were there for 40 years. And the Bible says in verse 8 of Joshua that they were circumcised with flint knives, and they stayed in the camp until they were healed. How long do you think it would take for a man, 58, 46, 33, et cetera, to get healed from circumcision administered by flint and eyes. I'll give it another week. That's 15 days. Plus, they are to march around mm, uh, the walls of Jericho one time a day for six days. And then seven times on the seventh. That's seven more days. That's 22 days at the minimum. And what is Rahab doing undoubtedly? Knocking on doors. And God is providing long suffering. Had God just said, just go in, no circumstance, no circumcision, etc., and wipe out the city, there would be people who perhaps would not have entered Rahab's house. But God gave them time. Ah, that's why uh, we ought to praise God, that God gave us time to hear the call of salvation. That's why Peter says in 2 Peter 3 and 9, God is not slack concerning his promises, but as long-suffering uh, toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And there may be someone here tonight. You're not here accidentally. You're not here incidentally. You're not here coincidentally. You are here providentially. God has spared your life, provided long-suffering, that you might hear the gospel, come to repentance and know Jesus Christ as the Lord of your life. I thank God that here is a woman who combines in her life justification by faith and justification by works. Hmm. Is that anathema, Robert Smith? Is this your last sermon tonight? Are you preaching heresy? Hmm. 
Well, according to Hebrews chapter 11, verse 31, by faith, mm, we like that. Rehab the prostitute took and did not perish with the spies, but welcomed them. We believe that. Sola fide, by faith. Romans 5, 1, therefore being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Right? We're saved by faith alone, through grace alone. But faith and grace alone are not alone. They are mm, in conjunction with works. And so James writes in James chapter 2, verse 25, Rahab the prostitute was justified or considered righteous by her works because she gave lodging to the spies and sent them a different way. Well, who's right? Who's wrong? Are these two titans fighting against each other, Paul or whoever wrote Hebrews, and uh, James? No. Paul, of course, believes in justification by faith. It is Romans 5 and 1, etc. They're both right. It's sequence. It's the indicative preceding the imperative. It's who I am that moves me to do what I do. It's who I am, and then the confirmation, the ratification comes by my works. John Calvin knew exactly what he was saying when he said this. Good works do not produce salvation. Salvation produces good works. Good works do, do not produce salvation. Salvation produces good works. So much so when you get saved, you get the Cain help us. It's what Peter and John were saying in Acts chapter 4, verse 20. We cannot help but to speak the things we've seen in her. It's what Paul is saying in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 14. The love of Christ compels me. I don't do it in order to become. I do it because I am. In other words, I'm becoming who I already am. I'm already saved. And there is this impetus, this motivation for me to work the works of him who sent me, as Jesus would say in John 9, for while it's day, for the night is coming when no one can work. Love constrains us to work, not for salvation, but from salvation. It is the indicative that precedes the imperative. It is the imperative that rests on top of the indicative and theologian Herman Ritterbaugh says that this sequence is not reversible. They are to cross the Jordan River. And the text says in Joshua 3.15 that when they are to cross the Jordan River, they are to cross it during the harvest season when the Jordan River was at flood stage. It just seems, humanly speaking, so illogical. Why would you want us to cross the Jordan River and the Jordan River is overflowing its banks? Why don't you wait until the waters subside? God is not logical. God is super logical. Isaiah says in Isaiah 55, 8 and 9, his ways are not our ways. His thoughts, your thoughts are not our thoughts. As high as the heavens are above the earth, so are his ways higher than our ways and his thoughts are higher than our thoughts. And they are to cross the Jordan River, a million and a half of them, when the Jordan River is overflowing its banks. But they have to do it during harvest season. They cross over. They eventually, in chapter 5, verses 10 to 12, they eventually have come to a place that after circumcision is over and they've celebrated the Passover, which they had not done for 40 years, they're able to do it because they needed some unleavened bread that uh, was roasted grain, and they have it because it's harvest season now. And the Bible says that the manna stopped that had been falling down for 40 years. Manna stopped. And verse, 10, verse 11 and 12 says that they ate of the fruit of the land for a whole year. Had they crossed at another time, no harvest, nothing to eat. But now that it's harvest season, those Jerichoites 
have left their olive yards and their gardens and the vegetation, squash, potatoes, peas, things like that. And the children of Israel spend the rest of the year eating it. That's, that, that's exactly why Joshua will say in Joshua chapter 24, verse 13, that God gave us wells that we didn't dig and houses that we didn't build and olive gardens and other vegetation that we didn't plant. We cross the Jordan River at harvest season when the waters have flooded its banks because God was setting us up to bless us. You, you think God has made some um, uh, incredible uh, demand on your life and you don't realize that he's done it because he wants to take you across the Jordan to set you up to bless you. You think he does it to bring you down. He does it to provide for you. So go on. Don't put God in a box. Don't try to measure God's decision. You can't do it. Trust him and know that God will allow you to go through. Incidentally, it didn't make any difference anyway because God made a highway in the Jordan River. Allow you to get to the other side. And there you will see the blessing that you would not have had if it was not harvest season and if the waters of Jordan were not overflowing the banks of the Jordan. I think, brothers and sisters, that Rahab, after all of this, eventually, eventually, that Rahab will have a new life. I can't prove it, but I just can't see her going back into this business of being a madame of prostitution after she gives this great confession in chapter 2 verses 10 to 11 that God is a God who is sovereign over heaven and earth. Going back to that. Can't see it. And I'd say this. When a person is truly converted, they can sing. I have ceased from my wandering and going astray since Jesus came into my heart. And my sins, which were many, are all washed away since Jesus came into my heart. Since Jesus came into my heart, floods of joy, oh my soul, like the sea billows roll. Since Jesus came into my heart, Rahab, I believe, had a new life. Rahab, I believe, had a new liturgy. I can't see her going back into idolatrous worship because Jericho was a city of uh, plurality in terms of idolatry, all kinds of gods, particularly the sun god. I think she had a new liturgy because she says God is the God of heaven and of earth. He holds the two together in sovereign simultaneity. He's in charge. And therefore, I think she adopted a new liturgy. She worshiped the one true God. I think she provides for us a picture of a new ecclesiology. When I say ecclesiology, I mean doctrine of church. Because now it's a woman who's in, if you let me put it this way, the Old Testament church. And Paul takes and deals with this, this kind of uh, dichotomizing people based upon various tags and various nomenclatures. He says in Galatians 3, 28, in Christ... There's neither bond nor free. In Christ, there's neither Jew nor Gentile. Here comes Rahab. In Christ, there's neither male nor female. We're in Christ. And here's a woman in the Old Testament that is a member now of the Old Testament church. And then I think she provides for us a new eschatology. By eschatology, I'm talking about the doctrine of future things. Because, as John will put it in Revelation 5 and 9 and Revelation 7 and 9, people from every tribe, every nation, every kindred, every tongue, Gallic or non-Gallic, will be a part of that eschatological kingdom. So you're looking at a brother and a sister here from America, 
from an African descent who will join with you in an eternal praise around the throne of our God. And here is Rahab from Jericho who will be a part of that celebration. I look at what happens in chapter 6 because you can't look at chapter 6, chapter 2 and ignore chapter 6. Uh, the children of Israel did not um, fight the battle of Jericho. God did it. God brought down the walls without a bulldozer or a crane. Uh, that's the, at the, the, the uh, advance guard of our men were in front, and then there were the priests who blew the shofar behind, and then there were the priests who carried the Ark of the Covenant, and then there were the priests who were part of the rear guard. They marched around the walls one time for six days, didn't say a word. And on the seventh day, they marched around it seven times. And then they shouted, and the walls came tumbling down. And the Bible says in verse 20 of chapter 6 of Joshua, mm, that when the walls came tumbling down, they fell down flat. The last time I looked in the dictionary at the word flat, flat meant flat, flat. And yet Rahab and her family are saved, spared. How? According to chapter 2 of Joshua, verse 15, Rahab's house was built in the wall. Now, if it was built in the wall and the wall fell down flat, how are Rahab and her family spared as Joshua 6.24, 6.25 tells us? I can't prove it, but I believe it's right that Rahab and her family are spared because of selective divine demolition. That God, through his power, since he pulled down the walls, allowed a section where her house was built into the wall to remain. And she's spared. Well, you don't say you can't find it in the scripture. No, I can't, but I can find it in my life that I've experienced everything all around me falling and God has kept me standing. Not because of my goodness, but because of his grace. Do you know what it's like when things around you, do you hear the songwriter say to us, when all around my soul gives way, he then is all my hope and stay on grace. The solid rock guys, he'll take and keep you when everything else is falling apart. Keep you standing to show that he is a sustainer and he is an upholder of his own people. Well, I need to wrap this up. I see my exit. Rahab the prostitute. What a dubious designation to carry, even in scripture all the way through. But when you come to Matthew chapter 1 verse 5, it says that Salmon married Rahab, but not the prostitute. Just says Rahab. This is the genealogy of Jesus. The only time the dubious designation drops is when Rahab is mentioned in the genealogy of Jesus, associated with Jesus. Salmon married Rahab, and they had a son by the name of Boaz, and Boaz married Ruth, and they had a son by the name of Obed, and Obed married, and had a son by the name of Jesse, and Jesse married, and had a son by the name of David, and David married, and ultimately had a son by the name of Jesus, so that Rahab becomes a great, great grandmother of our Savior. Redeemed, how I love to proclaim it. Redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Redeemed by his infinite mercy. His child and forever I am. Redeemed, redeemed, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Redeemed, redeemed, his child and forever I am.
I, th I think you'll join with me in thanking God Almighty, uh, Sola Dea Gloria, for that wonderful message we heard there. And we thank Robert for the you know, channel of his blessing there and our mouthpiece for uh, that wonderful message that we heard. But I also want to thank each and every one of you for coming here tonight and joining together in worship. The idea of the conference, uh, the motto for the conference is Psalm 133, verse 1. Behold, how good and pleasant it is when brethren to dwell together in unity. And I think we've done that tonight from all the different churches, all the different denominations. And where there is unity, there is blessing. Uh, it says in the last verse, so the blessing God commands, life that shall never end. So thank you to each and every one of you as well for coming. And uh, we, we have plenty there to think about and talk about after the, the service. So we'll conclude our worship by singing from Psalm 23. Psalm 23. And these well-known, well-loved words. The Lord's my shepherd, I'll not want. He makes me down to lie. In pastures green he leadeth me the quiet waters by. My soul he doth restore again, and me to walk doth make. Within the paths of righteousness, even for his own name's sake. Yea, though I walk in death's dark veil, yet will I fear none ill. For thou art with me, and thy rod and staff me comfort still. My table thou hast furnished, in presence of my foes. My head thou dost with oil anoint, and my cup overflows. Goodness and mercy all my life shall surely follow me. Yes, and in God's house forevermore my dwelling place shall be.
you just wait a moment after the service till uh, myself and Robert get to the front door and uh, you can meet them there outside and in the hall afterwards. So Robert, if you say the benediction. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.